Hello, I'm Steve Druchel. I'm a professor of civil engineering at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Title of my talk is Winter Plowing and De-Icing, Saving Money, Salt, and Labor by Distinguishing Best Practices from Urban Legends. In northern climes, we understand winter. We see it way too often. Roadways that are covered with snow, ice, blowing snow, and oh yeah, all too little sun for the day. It's hard to maintain bare open pavement, clean pavement, safe driving conditions in, in, this, in these conditions. But that's our job. That's what we want to do. We want to keep our people safe and our economy humming. Unfortunately, this is the time of bad accidents. These are the accidents that, at a minimum, are economically disrupting and at a maximum are life-changing events. We know these all too well as, as, as well if we're a road maintainer on it. So, Let's talk about winter maintenance. There are three different operations in winter maintenance of roadways. Plowing, de-icing, and protecting the waters. All are important. Our goals across those three are safety, improving efficiency, cut, to cut costs, to make the job easier, and make the job better. Our choices are labor, materials, equipment, predictability, level of service, and level of safety. Those last three, predictability, level of service, and level of safety, are choices we make using our labor materials and equipment. What we can't control, precipitation, temperature, and drivers. Those pesky drivers who want to go as bare road fast as they can 10 minutes after, 30 minutes after the storm is out. We need to slow them down, of course, but we can't control them. We know that. What I do know is that every plow driver is a scientist. They use the scientific method of, to observe, hypothesize, test, and evaluate. What does that look like? It might be a driver saying, wow, northbound lane doesn't, doesn't de-ice as fast as southbound lane in the mornings. Maybe it's a shading issue. Maybe it's a sun angle issue. Perhaps I should add a little more uh, load, salt load onto this, this lane. Try it come back 30 minutes later, an hour later, and see what the effect is. That's great, but how do we do evaluations when the weather changes, the sun moves, traffic comes and goes, and every geography has its own snow and ice. Ohio is not the same as Minnesota. Colorado is not the same as Idaho. We need to talk about these things and define it better. The way to do it is by side-by-side -side comparisons. Start with a really big piece of pavement, Add snow or, not, or ice, plow and salt, side by side in lanes. And then test factors at the same time, the same weather, the same snow, and in the same traffic. And then back it up with repeatability in both field and lab. Because luck should not be your best approach. All too often it is. Not when we're trying to make statements about efficiency and, and effectiveness. How do we approve efficiencies of winter maintenance through research? Well, bullet number one. Listen to operators, supervisors, and managers. Really hear them. Hear the comments that are coming through. They are the experts of the roadways. That let the observations come through and dictate which way we turn and what op options we try. But of course, the vendors are out there too. They're bringing us the salt materials or the de-icing materials or the granulars. And what is available? Well, add in some science and math to construct experiments, isolate factors and test them, compare conditions, organize, verify, emphasize, and then write and explain. Because without context and history, it's just a point observation. We need to weave it into the rich literature that is out there about snow plowing and its effectiveness. And then you emphasize the characteristics and controlling factors in the explanation. Minnesota State University Mankato and Minnesota DOT have had a long collaboration, eight years now, and we call it the Winter Area Road Maintenance Research, the warmer studies. And there's been three phases of these. The first was a lab study of ice melt capacity. How much melt can you get out of a given amount of de-icer? We tried 25 products and 50 blends from 30 degrees Fahrenheit all the way down to minus 30 Fahrenheit and developed a cost model out of it. It was great, it helped a lot. A lot of, of outreach came out of that. 
But in the end, the nickname Beaker Boy came out, meaning me, and all of my people that were in the lab studying stuff. Oh, I can take the name. Don't worry about that. But it's, that's not real pavement. That was in a laboratory. So phase two, we went out and did a field study. The winter of 2013-14, I call it the Burr winter because here in Minnesota, it was cold, long, and had a lot of snow. It was probably twice the winter of average. We put up nine lanes at 1,000 feet long. We plowed and did de-icing evaluations, testing for effectiveness. We also did a bridge where the pavement runoff was, was captured and chloride timing of the runoff was studied. And then phase three came, another field study, because we didn't quite get all the factors we wanted in the first one. And that was winners 2015, 16, and 16, 17. I call it the GER winners, because we were angry most of the time as researchers. We wanted consistent snow. They're, they were half winners. They were drought winners. We had snow droughts and not enough to study. Oh, I know the crews loved it because there was less to do and, you know, maybe they didn't get overtime, but on the other hand, they were rested and doing regular work. Heck, they were doing trees and catch basins. But in that, those two years, we compared, compared plow types and cutting edges. We defined controlling factors of de-icing, particularly traffic effects. I'm going to take you through some of these studies in this talk. Our experimental units ranged from the very small, the ice coupons, beakers, that we could do from temperatures of plus 30 down to minus 30. And a little larger, we did pavement patches that were about uh, one foot square and placed, you're going to see some pictures of these, were placed in a controlled temperature bath, and then we could test at temperatures. We did bridge cast, which was we took the bridge of study. It has a thousand foot of lane that we can work with, three lanes northbound, three lanes southbound, and we could test the actual conditions of de-icing out there. We had record on, on what was being placed. We did drainage off that bridge. We had eight different scuppers catching, 200 foot increments of lanes, two lanes per scupper. We also did test patches, square foot. Those are in the field, square foot size. We did test units that are 20 by 50 feet, 50 feet long by lane width, or 20 of them at 50 feet long. And then we did the test lanes I talked about earlier, the 1,000 foot lanes. Nine of them side by side, we could go up to 35 miles an hour. We couldn't have done it without student labor, student workers who committed an awful lot of time and uh, energy and long underwear and hot socks to this work. They were out there most all, every one of the days. About 15 students worked on the, the, these projects over three years, or over, uh, three projects over eight years. This is our test facility with 1,000 foot lanes. This is in the back parking lot at the Valley Fair uh, Amusement Park. It's a water park. They don't need the parking lot in the winter. So they were nice enough to share it with us and our plows. Not the most perfect pavement, but good pavement, side by side lanes. In the photo there, you see tall PVC poles. Those are where we hang cameras for recording observations. And in the, the shorter uh, PVC sections are flags so that our plows, when it snows, our plows can find the lanes. Here's a photo of it during a snowy season uh, right after testing. We had a second facility at Canterbury Downs, a racetrack, again, not used, uh, a parking lot not used in the winter. And here we have 500 foot long lanes, four of them side by side. We broke them into 50 foot test sections, separated by 50 feet so we don't get carry through effects. And again, you see the camera poles and the flags for the lane markers. And here's what Canterbury looks like in the winter when we're testing. So we put up and wait for snow and we get some snow and then it melts. Oh, and well, we get some more snow and it melts. And sometimes this is the sign that we use. Our facility is closed. The rule we had with our crews was we would not ask for the crews to come out on an active plow day. The snow would have to last to the day after so that we weren't pulling off any operational crews from actively supporting roadway safety. But it, we're working in Minnesota, so sooner or later it does snow. And we get our facilities ready and it's time to go plowing. A note on our technologies, we use seven different cameras out on these, on these sites. P majority of them are time-lapse cameras, game cameras. And different kinds, different styles have different lenses, so they have different uh, frame of reference and ability to capture. Place them on poles, set them off on a constant one to five minute time that will be going on. 
we might capture 10 to 12,000 photographs in a day out of four, up to 40 cameras. Uh, the good news is uh, those students working, uh, when you hand a student 40 flashcards and say, keep them organized, uh, let's not lose any of these photos, uh, they're pretty good at managing that and have been uh, a real blessing on this project. But file management and, and managing the photographic data is a big part of this project. Okay, let's get into the details. For the warmer projects, the warmer studies, we did a lot of evaluations, nine of them total. Let's quickly go through them. The first is a lab study that would evaluate the ice melt capacity and effectiveness. The second is when we tested plows and cutting edges for difference in performance. That was a field at Valley Fair. The third, we compared de-icers and pre-wets, and that was done at Canterbury. The fourth, the evaluate, uh, to evaluate traffic influence on de-icing, done both at Valley Fair and Canterbury. Fifth, assess effects for coloration and chloride content in pre-wets, Canterbury and field. Sixth, evaluate residence time of de-icer on pavement through drainage monitoring. That was on our bridge site, the US 169 North Star Bridge in Mankato. Seventh was to evaluate de-icer movement through plow cast, how much salt leaves, in that case, the pavement or the bridge. And then we eight, we evaluated speed of de-icers and pre-wets, how well they helped, again, a lab study. And ninth, we compared effects of pavement types and ages, also done in the lab. Let's look at them in specific. Number one, let's compare plows for cast and cloud. What you're seeing is three different plows. Let me point to the board a bit. At the left, top left, 25 miles an hour. The middle, 30 miles an hour. And the bottom right, 35 miles an hour. All the same truck, all side by side lanes, all the same day, probably across a 10 minute span. And what we're looking at here, at the way we break down uh, our photographic results, is to see what the cast is coming off the plow. You'll see on the, the driver's side right, or excuse me, the passenger side right, the, the cast is coming off the plow. When we compare across speeds, the faster it goes, the farther the cast goes. Kind of makes intuitive sense. To toss it further off the roadway, faster is good. The problem with faster is that off the back end, the salt particles will bounce more and, and less of them will actually stay on the pavement. But continue looking at the plow in the photos. We also have clouding. Clouding is the, the snow mobilizing in the air and particularly we're worried about on the driver's side because that's the side that a car is gonna pass the plow. And if they go through a blind spot because they can't see for a short while, they may come in too early and hook the plow. That's a pretty horrible occurrence because likely it's gonna end up in a fatality. Clouding is probably one of the greatest safety pieces we can do is prevention of clouding on this. Well, what do we see with speed for the same plow? As we, as we increase speed, we get a little bit more clouding on the driver's side, that left side. However, this is a one-way plow that's pretty well behaved. This plow had a baffle on the far left, and so most of that cloud is contained. Let's try another situation. We tried Carver County, Minnesota. Thank you, my friends at Carver County. One day they brought nine plows to study. We told them we, do, we need to borrow a whole range of plows. They brought us everything that they could, every driver they had, I think. Uh, they were on site for 55 minutes, I believe, including a safety talk. Nine different plows, different kinds. Now, with these nine, we only have nine lanes we have no repeatability. So we don't have the ability to evaluate whether there was the same conditions run after run after run. These are all supposed to be at 30 miles an hour. My students, my students who were in the cab were hearing little bits about, we're gonna really shake this one up. I can't blame any driver for wanting to show off their plow and their rig. But for science sake, we're holding this a little bit light. But let's continue on with the assumption that these are all at 30 miles an hour. You see a variety of plows here. You see one-way plows, poly plows cranked down to one-way configuration. We see dozer plows, all truck mounted, all trucks about the same weight. Let's go into one specifically, a little different than the previous one-way we had looked at. Here you see a plow coming down the lane, uh, 30 miles an hour. We now have a much larger cast 
and it's entraining air underneath it. It's rolling off that plow. That entrained air is putting up a, a um, uh, sorry, the cast is coming off and, and it's entraining air. The cloud behind is now bigger than the previous one we had. Some little difference in that plow configuration is showing up here that is causing greater clouding to occur. On the driver's side, that left point though, it is very well behaved. We have a small, nice, tight uh, uh, cloud there that won't bother anybody at this speed. Let's look at a, at a poly plow. Again, crank down into one-way configuration, not as tight as it could go, but at an average operational style. Um, casting to the right, we see uh, off the passenger side, we see solid cast. It's getting out there, not as far or as effective as the steel one-way, but pretty darn good. It's getting into the ditch line. That's great. We do have the clouding occur. This is probably one lane over from the previous photo. The clouding is occurring and floating behind the truck. But notice that left-hand side, the driver's side, that point at which a, a passenger car would pass. Now we have a large leakage there, and the snow is clouding up. We may have a visibility problem there. So polyplow, very flexible in many ways, and, and allows adaptation for plowing. But it has this leakage issue, not making any judgments on the value of a plow because it's situationally, it, it applies in what, which situation it's being used in. But for lane for lane straight up, we got a little bit of a cloud problem there on the left. A dozer plow, very effective, can use it left, can use it right. Um, steel, it's going to last a long time, great. Problem is, the cast is not very focused, nor is the cloud very tight. The clouding is kind of all over the place, and this thing going down the road is going to be a visibility problem. However, if you're plowing a roundabout, this might be the one you want. Ramps, you might want the one-way plow. Or the, sorry, you might want the, the dozer plow because you can convert from one side to another. The flexibility might be what counts. Is this the best at a high, as a highway plow? Probably not. Comparing one-way plows, two of them side by side. There are slight differences you see, particularly in the clouding. The, the, the plow on the right has greater clouding going on. It seems as if the uh, cast is getting more air underneath it, which may be a function of how the snow is spinning outside the barrel of the plow. Two different dozer plows side by side. Again, the plow on the right is showing a much larger cloud and a much, and a much un, more unfocused cast going on. So there are differences. Side by side testing, we can define those differences. Again, I want to note, we weren't positive we had speed control on these drivers. Well-meaning though that they, they were. These are the time-lapse cameras, a couple of photos, one from uh, being on the uh, passenger side and one from the driver's side, the ahead version on driver's side, the behind version on the, on the passenger side. And you just see a difference here, how they work. Um, this is the business end of these time-lapse cameras. Our, our drivers will cut it very close to the cameras, which is great. Sometimes they, the cameras get hit. Sometimes we don't find the camera again until meltout in April. It's the price of doing business. Let's compare plows for cut and compaction. Nine different lanes. We're not going to go into this in depth because what we're looking for is uniformity in the cut underneath the blade. It's how much pavement's coming out, or if it's not right on pavement, don't want to wreck your pavement. But if it's, if it's up a little bit, is the, is the blade staying level on the pavement or is it rising and falling a little bit with the motion? How is it riding? If in this case, the, the blades were sitting right on pavement, they weren't held up by hydraulics. So how uniform is that cut going down? Again, the nine different plows of Carver County, I believe this is. Compaction is a big deal. Compaction is the snow compacting and then sticking to the pavement. But that requires a moist snow condition. That doesn't exist in these photos. This is a dry snow. But that was, again, something we would look at, how much compaction occurred in different snows and for different cutting edges of plows. We compared effects of traffic on de-ice lanes. We're going to spend a little time on this one. So here is a little heavy for a dry snow, 600 pounds a lane mile of, of sodium chloride, salt, rock salt, 28 degrees, midday full sun, January 5th, so the lowest, pretty much the lowest we're going to get sun. And this is a photo just after plowing. 
On the left, you see no traffic, meaning we didn't run any traffic after this. We just left this lane alone. On the right, you see a lane, we're going to run three passes of a truck on it. And so this is right after plowing. We'll take a step and look at 10 minutes after plowing. Starting to see no traffic. There's a little bit of opening here. That's good. But on the right, with the truck traffic, there's greater opening. Let's move ahead 10 more minutes, 20 minutes total. And now we're seeing differences occur. 20 minutes, uh, granted it's a 28 degree day, the sun's out, this is a glory time for snow plowing. So we're melting very, very well. The pavement has opened up, great. 28 degrees, tr truck traffic's helping. Let's go to 30, even better, let's go to 60. And at this point, with the truck traffic, with the lane is pretty much wide open. With no traffic, it's still fighting its way out. Let me back up a little and we'll walk this back to the starting point and now I'm going to go faster through these and then we'll go back and here you can see how it changes over time again forward it isn't the end point that matters it's the point at which the next car or vehicle or truck is out on that pavement so it's the progression through that we're looking at. We want pavement open faster. Here, clearly, truck traffic, even just three passes of truck traffic, helps a lot to open up the pavement. No traffic, it's fighting its way out. Let's try another one. Again, the same kind of conditions. 600 pounds of lane mile, 28 degrees, that full Sunday, midday in January. But we have car on the left and truck on the right. The truck pictures are the same ones you just saw. But let's try it with a car. What happens? Okay, right after traffic, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. Both are opening up, but the truck is doing a little better. Let's back up and try again, faster now. And you can see that the car is opening, going back again and forward, and even with five passes on the car, our camera, I think, got creamed on the three-pass lane. Even with the five passes of the car, we are getting much better opening with the truck traffic. Moderately better opening with the truck traffic. Got to watch my adverbs there. Try another one. Let's compare two different days and two different temperatures. On the left, we have 22 degrees, midday sun, about the same time period. And on the right, the 28 degrees. The right-hand side are the same photos you had seen before. So same salt condition, 600 pounds of lane mile, and we're gonna try three passes of a truck on each, each set of lanes. Okay, just after the traffic, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. Let's go back and then go forward again. And one more time back and forward. And what we're seeing is the 28 degrees midday sun is much more effective in helping that post-traffic treated pavement come open. The 22 degrees doesn't come open as much. Well, yeah, of course, everybody knows, we should, that salt works better at 28 degrees than at 22 degrees. That's intuitive and that makes sense, but that has to be proven and shown that it works in our science. If this didn't come up and show itself, we would question the validity of our observations at all. Let's compare color and chloride content. How did we do that? Well, it was during the snow drought year. We still had snow on pavement. In fact, we had compacted snow. And we put out small patches and put down different de-icer combinations with different dyes on them, different color agents, different pre-wets. We were able to try 45 different sample side-by-side -side little one-foot test patches. The little piece of wood you might see in some of the photos is to indicate what treatment had been down on there. And then we would take their photograph, not just photo photo, but we would take it with, with the uh, thermography, with uh, the uh, thermal imagery, infrared. And what you see on the top are three conditions of rock salt, and on the bottom, three conditions of sand only. So no de-icer, just a granular. The dark spots are the, is the rock salt disaggregating into its ionic components. A lot of phrase there. That means the sodium and the chloride are separating. It's the same effect that um, causes the cold when you want to make ice cream in the summer. Well, that's how the, the sodium chloride turns from rock salt into dissolved product that will reduce the melt point of snow. 
So we see the three different top ones, all salt, showing that they're, the cold spot is there and it's occurring, the, the, the grain is, is coming apart, that's good. In the bottom, we don't see those cold spots. There's no salt. It's sand. But let's compare across. On the left is no pre-wet. On the center is a pre-wet of, of salt brine. And on the right is an apex uh, pre-wet. And then do we see differences? Do we see temperature signals? Let's just say this takes a lot of concentration and focus and reviewing these photos at length and also over time. But the bottom line is sand doesn't help a whole lot. But it's, we'll come up to those those conclusions in a bit. Let's look at the bridge project, the drainage. What did we do here? We evaluated the conditions when a bridge, the bridge pavement is taken from this uh, configuration uh, immediately post-storm to this configuration about two days later. Don't notice that the camera is on the driver's side of the car. I don't know how that happened. I guess I was reaching across. Silly me. But we have a situation where at this point the pavement is cleared out. We have a little bit of residual uh, snow and, and compaction uh, stuck up on the bridge rail. But how long does the de-icer last on the roadway? That was our question. We were looking at, we had, we had records from uh, the, the truck records communicating the satellite link and recorded that we knew how much de-icer was going down on the bridge. How long did it take for it to show up in the drainage? We used uh, the sequence of from pavement to the edge of pavement, it would get caught, the drainage would get caught in a scupper uh, and then drop down through a downspout to a discharge point. And we hooked up a 55 gallon juice drum, uh, cleaned uh, to that, but that's what we use as a flow through cell. So the drainage comes down, flows through that drum. We have inside of that a monitor of chloride content. And then you can see in the, the drum here, there is a cut there that is a V-notch weir, and by measuring the height on that weir, we can convert that to flow. As you can see, if you look really close on the photograph, there's debris that's showing up and messing a little bit with those flow calculations. But we're testing what the chloride is that we see in our flow-through cell versus the time at which it was placed on the pavement. We'll get to the results in a bit. Bridge cast, same bridge. We installed buckets, uh, Rubbermaid buckets, off the edge. We wanted to look at, of the cast that goes over the bridge, how much chloride is on that and how far does it go out? Well, intuitively, we'd say, oh, there's going to be some salt in it and it's going to, the farther you cast, the farther it goes. Okay, that sounds good. Is it real? This was an uh, experiment that took all winter to, to run, to set up. We had to go out, and as you see on the left, we had to go out in pre frost, drive stakes, those stakes are going to stabilize our bins so they don't get knocked around and they stay stable to catch the snow coming off because cast coming off a 30 foot high bridge comes down with a lot of weight in a wet storm. Then the day before the storm, the other two pictures, you can see the, the bins are placed and have been wired in to the previously had fallen snow past snow, snowstorm. And on the bottom left photo, you can see where the snow is kind of hard and rotted a little bit along the bridge. That's because that's previous storm cast that's in there. The day of the storm, you can see our favorite truck 10 there in the upper left is coming along plowing, pushing snow up over the bridge rail, getting it off the roadway, cleaning up. In the middle photograph, down below, you can see the bins there collecting the snow uh, from the same vantage point that I shot the photo before. Uh, the snow is coming off landing down there. You can hear the truck coming from half a mile away. It's a great sight. And here's a reverse shot on the right of the cast as it falls onto the buckets. That's during the storm. The day after the storm, one of those beautiful movie-like uh, photos, uh, you can hear the, the wonderful music coming up because sun's coming out and the roads are going to get cleaned up. And you can see our 10 bins sitting there, five in sight and five more that are buried. They have done their job collecting all of the cast off the bridge. We dig them out, uh, uh, cut the snow so that we only get what's above that known area of the bin, bring them into the lab, melt them down, measure them up, and evaluate chloride by its landing point. How about another experiment? I know this is getting long. Hang with me. The good stuff's coming. Anti-icer persistence on pavement patches at three different temperatures. Again, how long does, does de-icer material, in this case placed before storm, how long does it last on the pavement? Well, we constructed these uh, large temperature controlled containers 
Um, the students call them the personal hot tubs. Uh, I was uh, very pleased that nobody climbed in one of them wet and found a little pool party at the college some uh, Saturday night when I, if I'm coming in. But the, you can see it's all blue board form, uh, foam, insulation, uh, three inch thick, and then lined uh, multiple times to hold on to um, a brine ice mixture. A little bit of uh, high school chemistry to bring back for you. This is a, uh, if we have uh, brine material, the brine, so pure water will freeze at 32 degrees. Brine will freeze at down to as low as about 12 degrees. And so you get a mixture of ice and salty water. Or if it's 32 degrees, it'll be ice and water while it's freezing. Before it becomes full ice or before it melts out and becomes just water, it will have, because of thermodynamic laws, it'll have a constant temperature. By changing the amount of the, the concentration of the brine, we can set that freeze point temperature. It took us a while to figure this out, but we got kind of good at it. And we're able to now put temperatures in this bath that'll hold for several days at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, or 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And within that ice brine, we then place, as you see in the upper right, pavement chunks that have a demarked area and, and controlled drainage as much as you can on an eight, by eight, eight inch by eight inch area, and that we can then capture any runoff and test it for chloride. So we're looking at a pavement at a, a freezing temperature, 12 degrees perhaps, and then we're applying de-icer, and then we're applying precipitation on top of that. If the de-icer works, hey, it'll just melt out. If the de-icer has already come off, then the applied precipitation will freeze to the pavement. Okay, that's the end of the experiments. Let's go to the, the money in this whole, these three studies and eight years of work. What have we learned? Okay, what everyone knows, but tends, people tend to forget or ignore. First rule, drivers sh should slow down. The best improvement in safety is to slow the traffic down even close the highway. You want to keep everybody safe and on the roadway? Maybe the answer is don't let them get out there. Sometimes that works. Second, level of service. It's a decision of our highway management. How clean are the roads and how soon after the, st after the storm? This is a very big discussion point. It has a significant influence on cost, labor, and materials. You want, a, you want a pavement clean within 30, 30 minutes? You've got to have trucks able to get out there and cover it in 30 minutes. Well, if you're in a place that only snows three times a year, you probably don't have trucks enough for that. That's, that's an unrealistic expectation for the way public spending is right now. We need to name that and say that. This is a risk equation, and it's really a management decision that has to go on. It's more than the, a single plow operator can be expected to interpret and determine. Everybody wants the roads clean, we get that, but how soon, how many trucks, how many people do we have working on for a given crew in a given storm? Third, plowing, mechanical removal, is generally best. Why? It's environmentally friendly, it's quickest, and it clears the greatest amount of snow and ice. Shovel first. Don't try to melt your way out of a snowstorm. Won't work. Ice storm, eh, maybe that's a different story, but Ideally, it's the plow that's going to be the best friend. Pound for pound, the plow is hugely in, uh, in better than trying to just throw chloride on. A plow is generally, except that it's driving a truck, I suppose, but the plow is not going to leave salt behind it unless salt is placed on it. Um, the plowing is going to be clean pavement and just precipitation in the ditch to melt out. Fourth, the icing takes time. You just can't rush, rush physical chemistry. Typically, 20 minutes minimum, unless you have traffic there to help, traffic can improve it down to the 10 minute level, but it still is gonna be more than the back of a truck. Our drivers should all, our drivers, meaning our public, should all know this, because the idea of following a truck uh, to follow the salt and the salt's gonna work, well, you better get back about 20 miles if you're gonna do that, not the let's get right close to the truck. That's following a plow, not following the de-icing. Next, let's go to the proving the hunches level. Rock salt works best at warmer temperatures. This is pretty well known. It doesn't work well below 20 degrees and not at all below 12 degrees. We have to switch to a different chemical. 
would have to be a magnesium chloride or calcium chloride, for example, or one of the acetates. Second, sand is lost quickly with traffic. The sand will be uh, ejected or tossed off by the spray on tires. Sand creates a false confidence to drivers. They see it because it's the dark color, and then they think, oh, I can go my highway speed. That's great, we've got traction. It doesn't last long at all. Plus, sand chokes your stormwater systems and needs cleaning out in the spring. You may have pavement distress because you didn't get your water out because it was all choked with sand from your winter operations. Third, organics and liquid de-icers can cause problems. They've been used and added. They do help with, with depressing the, the, the freeze point. That's great. But the organics then have to break down. And they're going to break down in the receiving streams. And that can cause an oxygen sag oxygen deprivation, that is, meaning the fish might not have enough to breathe in the water. And we have seen occurrences of winter fish kills when there's melt out. And it's, of course, that's all happening right when all the hatches are coming. So it's like the worst possible time. Organics can help because of the stickiness or because of a cost impact. Um, but that same stickiness can also encourage corrosion. Uh, organics are going to stick the chlorides closer to the equipment and we may end up with equipment life being reduced. Fourth, pre-wets of any kind, they don't increase melt capacity much. Okay, pre-wet fans, stay with me here because I have good, good news about pre-wets in a little bit. But don't expect by pre-wetting a grain, putting liquid on the grain as it's coming off the truck, don't expect that that's going to increase the melt capacity. It does other things. It helps the adhesion of the grain to the surface, it can help with dry snow, all of that. We'll talk about that in a slide. But it's not going to increase the melting. And really, you're not trying to melt. You're trying to dislodge. And so it's a different kind of thing. But don't listen if anyone's saying, oh, just coat it with this material and it'll just melt right out the roads. No, dislodging the compaction, yes. And particularly in uh, colder temperatures, a pre-wet of calcium chloride or magnesium chloride can help a lot. Okay, the new stuff. This is where we're on the front edge of what we found. New concepts and interpretations. First, traffic on de-icers can improve performance. As little as three passes, trucks are best, but cars aren't bad, and tire pressure seems to enhance the melt initiation and speed, plus it destroys the crystal ice structure of the, the compaction snow. You saw a lot of pictures on this uh, 20 minutes ago. Second, Pre-wets don't make much difference, breathe, unless it's dry snow, then pre-wets make all the difference. We didn't see any impact. Our drivers and people kept saying pre-wets work, pre-wets really help. When we tested side by side, we couldn't see the impact until it was a dry snow day and then it was huge difference. And I was honestly just taking photographs laughing with joy because finally I could validate what people have been telling me. But we're talking about dry snow, snow that when you pack it in your hand will just fall apart. No snowball time in that. The kids don't like it because they can't make uh, snowmen, any of that. Pre-wets are, really are, are more of an adhesion concept when it's wet snow. But in dry snow and snow that's going to blow, the pre-wet makes tremendous diff difference. Excuse me. Then sun on the ice or solid has little effect. Even placing colorized snow down there, or colorized salts down, we couldn't see that it attracted sun rays. We kind of thought it did. It might, never saw an effect. Now, pavement, yes, open pavement, that's about a 10 degree difference in January in Minnesota. So that was making a lot of difference. De-icers, well, they detach from pavements very quickly in drainage. They go off fast. They don't stay at all long. We, once, the, once the snow is um, uh, uh, disconnected and detached from the, displaced from the pavement, then pretty much that water is taking all of your de-icer with it as well. Don't expect it's going to last long. Now, anti-icing, pre-storm treatment of pavements is not a bad idea. It's actually shown to work really well. And if you place it before, then it'll keep compaction from occurring during storm. That's great but it won't last long. It'll only be out there five to 10 minutes at most. It's enough to help you get started in the storm to keep material from building up. Just don't expect that uh, an anti-icer placed is gonna be still helping days or hours later even. 
And then lastly, plow cast removes large amounts of de-icer in longer storms. The more times the trucks are doing rounds on pavement, the more the de-icer is ending up in the ditch line, not the drainage. I want to point you to three reports that we put out. These are all available on the MnDOT Research Services website. Phase one, phase two, phase three of the different years. Please read these. They have a lot more detail in it. You really don't want me reading these to you. They also have all of our literature review, particularly the phase three report. We codified that, uh, talking about all the people that we depended on who have come before us and have taught us lessons that's in the literature. Uh, also, you'll see all our results so you can run your own experiments, and please do. Please add to this literature and discussion. A note about being photogenic. Um, students in particular uh, seem to attract attention. Uh, the drivers liked having the students around, uh, but more than that, news crews, news crews call. And news crews like to call uh, plowing operations late January, early February, slow news days. Many people have gotten these phone calls. The students help. They, they, they get out there. But what, what I want to point out with this is uh, best summed up in a little video that was done of our work. Let me go to this. Minnesota State Mankato Professor Steve Drachelle has a big idea. Make winter roads okay. Studio work again. Uh, it's a beautiful video produced by Minnesota State University. It is an advert uh, Mankato. It is an advertisement to for people to come to the university. That's great, but this was a trade in a sense. Uh, we were willing to let myself and our three students in that picture be used as an advertisement for the university in trade for. The safety officer was willing to talk to me about ladders and students on the ground next to moving trucks. I was able to get insurance coverage a lot easier. I got uh, discussion from deans and vice presidents who gave me much more support than if I was just trying to do work on my own. Sometimes a trade for publicity is a way to get more evaluation. And it's not about being rich and famous, like that's going to happen, from a video about snow plowing. It's more about can you give me the resources I need to help public safety? It's about getting the kids to school, the people to work, grandma to her card game or whatever she wants. It's about keeping everybody safe. This is a wonderful business. And it's, if it takes a little PR trading, these experiments are a good way to use that. I want to acknowledge my favorite people in the world, MnDOT Research Services, Canterbury Park, Valley Fair, the Chaska Truck Station in Minnesota, the District 7 Mankato Truck Station, and Carver County Public Works. Over eight years of work, these folks have all pitched in and helped in, in many, many ways and supported us with not only trucks, equipment, materials, but also encouragement and the knowledge from their observations. Plow strong. <laughs>